State-dependent memory has to do with your internal state, physiological, emotional, and even related to drugs. Recall of information is better if you're in the same emotional or drug state as when information was learned in the first place. Now the classic examples are people who smoke cigarettes or drink caffeine in their coffee or soda drinks. If you're doing that when you study, guess what you should do when you take the exam? You should load up on the average amount of coffee you drank or cigarettes you smoked so that you're in the same state emotionally and physiologically. Research shows your performance will improve, but if you go into the test not having had that cigarette or the amount of coffee you're used to, performance will suffer. And conversely, let's say that you did all your studying caffeine and nicotine free. Do not go into the test center lighting up or having a quick soft drink before you do that because it puts you in a different state and performance could suffer. Another type of memory that seems to go against all the rules of sensory, short-term, and then going to long-term memory is what we call flashbulb memory. It seems that you experience something and it is immediately stored in long-term memory. For example, look at this picture. This is the famous skyline of a major United States city. Can you guess what this is? It would have been taken before September 11th, wouldn't it? It's the New York City skyline. And the flashbulb memory I have of September 11th is seems like it almost happened yesterday, but we're coming up on 10 years ago. I can go into detail where I was when I heard the news, when I heard the news driving to work, and what, and what happened when I got to work that day, how everything was just tossed upside down. What is your flashbulb memory for September 11th? It seems like it happened just yesterday. There was no rehearsal, there was no chunking, there was no nothing. It seems to be permanently imprinted on us. And finally, I want to mention amnesia and interference. Amnesia is a partial or total loss of memory. Now, one myth here, what you see dramatized on TV, is that this is a total loss of memory, or people who go for years and even relocate to another part of the country not knowing anything about their previous identity. That does happen, don't get me wrong, but that's very rare. Most cases of amnesia are partial and just last a few minutes at most, and then a the person regains memory. There's two types of amnesia, anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia refers to the inability to store new information, and specifically, the inability to store new information after some sort of physical or psychological trauma. As you can imagine, the hippocampus would be evolved here, and a person just cannot learn going forward. Now, their memory for before the trauma, that stays intact, and they can recall perfectly. There's nothing wrong with that. But the inability to store new information, to learn and make new memories, that is impaired. If a person had anterograde amnesia and meets you and shakes your hand and you walk around the corner into another room in the house and you come back a few minutes later, they may not recognize you and go through the whole process again. In contrast to this, we have retrograde amnesia. This is the inability to remember past information. Now here, again, a person has some sort of physical, psychological trauma and they can learn and make new memories going forward, but they have trouble recalling past information. And it may be their own personal identity. And it does, in fact, usually affect episodic memory. Who they are, where they've been, the people they've met in all their life episodes. Now, in amnesia, when a person suffers that, they have trouble remembering. But interference, essentially, a person will learn, but they are very slow. There's problems with learning due to interference. And there's two types, proactive and retroactive. Let me go over proactive first. Here is where information and experience hinders your ability to learn new information. 
And we call it proactive because the interference moves forward from the past to the present. Let me give you an example. Let's say you moved into, an, into your dorm here on the college campus or new housing and you've come straight from your parents. Well, you were used to getting up in the middle of the night, I bet, with very little lighting, maybe completely pitch black, and going from your room to the bathroom or to the kitchen, literally blindfolded. Now, in the new dorm, new housing, you try to do that, you may walk smack dab into a wall or down some steps. You're having trouble learning the floor plan. We call this proactive interference. The old experience hinders your ability to learn new information. And then finally, retroactive interference. This is where new learning interferes with the ability to recall prior information. It's just the opposite. Just the opposite. And here the interference moves backwards from the present to the past. Here's an example. Let's say you have learned and you've mastered Win Office 2007. You know that at home and here at school, you're learning Windows 2010, which has just come out. But when you go back home with your own computer, used to 2007, that you're having trouble working 2007. This is retroactive interference. The new learning is interfering with your ability to recall prior learned information. Oh, hey guys. You know what I'm doing? I'm floating. And it's not because I feel so happy about the bakery department handing out free samples, even though they are right now, back there in aisle five. Yeah, I'm floating because I'm trying out a new memory technique called chunking. And chunking is a technique where you combine or chunk several pieces of information into one unit. Most people can only remember about seven items at one time. When you combine many smaller bits of information into one larger piece of information, you only have to remember one item. You can chunk anything that has something in common. When I go to the grocery store, I can chunk these things into different categories. By type of food, by recipe I need the item for, by color. But like most people, I'm chunking them by sections of the store, like the produce section. So today I need red delicious apples, oranges, figs, uh, lettuce, and tomatoes. I can put all of these in one section on my list, like produce. Or if I want to memorize them, I can lump these items together and try to make a word using the first letter of each item. So I only have to remember one word. In this case, my word is float. Figs, lettuce, oranges, apples, tomatoes. If I can remember the word float, I can remember all of the produce I need to buy. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to continue floating. This is researcher Tetsuro Matsuzawa with a chimpanzee named Ai and her son Ayumu. Yes. Ai, spelled A-I, means love in Japanese, and Ayumu means walk. But they'll both make you wonder how to say savant in Japanese. The mother and son live at Kyoto University's Primate Research Institute where Matsuzawa and his colleagues have been conducting cognitive experiments since 1977, the year I, the chimp, arrived as a one-year-old. In March, I went to a conference in Chicago on the mind of the chimpanzee, and it opened with Matsuzawa describing his studies of wild chimpanzees in Guinea, Africa, and experiments that he's done with I and Ayumu in Kyoto. The audience included most every alpha male and female in chimp research. Jane Goodall, Franz Duvall, Richard Wrangham, Christoph Bosch. When Matsuzawa showed videos of his experiments with the captive chimps, people gasped, oohed, and awed. This is Ayuma touching numerals in ascending order. Each time he touches the numbers in the correct sequence, a buzzer goes off and the machine dispenses a treat. This is his mother, I, doing the same task all the way up to the number nine. Apparently, humans can train chimpanzees to recognize the numbers zero through nine. Are the chimpanzees actually counting? Some contend they're simply recognizing symbols in order. Whatever. At the very least, it's an impressive trick. But what really blew people's minds was this experiment. The computer again randomly splashes numbers on the screen. And after I touches the first one, white rectangles mask the other numbers. I then has to touch them in order. This is a test of short-term memory. And clearly, I is remarkable. Watch this again. When Jaws dropped at the meeting, Matsutsawa said, 
I know. No one can do it. Matsuzawa asserts that chimpanzees have better short-term memory than humans. He theorizes that the common ancestor to humans and chimpanzees also had a muscular short-term memory, but that the quick recall skills of humans got flabbier when we developed complex language. Basically, it was a trade-off. Developing a bigger brain came at a cost. One researcher told me that he thinks if a human put as many hours into this task as the chimps have, he might find that no real difference exists between the species. Maybe. I give the chimps more credit. Of course we're smarter than chimpanzees, but that doesn't mean our brains are better at every task. Evolution isn't a linear march to perfection. Over time, you win some, you lose some. Chimpanzees, for example, don't develop AIDS from HIV. They're also up to five times stronger than we are. Matsuzawa's work with Ai and Ayumu is only one of many projects exploring the chimpanzee brain. New genetic research may one day help explain such mysteries as why we have complex language and they don't. Other scientists are analyzing how chimps dodge Alzheimer's, communicate with facial expressions, and the degree to which they empathize, teach, and have culture. Sure, only humans have the ability to ask, have you seen my keys? But Matsuzawa's work suggests that maybe chimps don't need to ask. For Slate V, I'm John Cohen.